universal basic income. The government puts money on your bank account every month, enough to cover your basic expenses. It's a huge topic, getting very popular nowadays, and we hear the media reporting about successful experiments. It looks as if it's just a matter of time before we will be implementing this in a major country. So because it's such a big thing, I decided to research it myself. And in this video, I'll be showing a summary of the, these research results. I'll be starting with Finland, one of the most famous ones, then the Canada Mincom experiment from the 70s, Kenya, give directly, where a charity does some experiments, then we'll contribute the Cherokee Indians Casino, even in the United States, then we'll look at the Iran subsidy reform, all subsidy reform, and lastly, the Mongolia resource to cash scheme. Let's start with the research. The Finnish Universal Basic Income Experiment, probably the most famous one, and all around the world it was reported that it was successful, and it was shown as a proof that it really works. So I went and made some research, look at also the Finnish newspapers, that is the English ones, and it comes out that there has never been a basic income experiment in Finland. So you must say, so what did they report on? It turns out that Finland was testing an alternative unemployment benefit. You see, normally in Finland, like in many countries, they, you get an unemployment benefit when you lose your job, and whenever you find a job, you lose that benefit. Plus, you need to do you know, some bureaucratic stuff, show that you are really searching. They said that, what if we give them unemployment benefit without conditions, and they don't lose it when they get a new job? The logic being that, if you don't just lose your benefit, you might be motivated to get a job earlier, because you get your salary, on top you get that benefit as well, you can combine them nicely. So that was their logic. They wanted to increase employment, make people motivated to look for a job more. What happened is that one, nothing happened, basically. Employment, there was no impact on employment. In both groups, whether you get this new benefit or old benefit, they were employed more or less at the same time. So the Finnish actually stopped this experiment. But what I also discovered, I think they were also motivated to find at least some positive thing, that the well-being of the group that get this benefit was higher than the group that did not get it. And then this piece of information was taken, a bit of, obviously quite a lot of out of context, and then all newspapers were reporting that basic income experiment in Finland is successful. In reality, the <laughs> experiment actually had failed to increase employment and was stopped. And plus the well-being part was even not very logical, because it is actually quite logical that the, when you are selected to a special program where you don't have any bureaucratic stuff and so on, you might feel a bit better than the people who were not selected to it, because it was very public, it was a very public experiment. So they might just feel good that because they were selected. And this well-being part was not actually within the research. So they did not even check how the well-being of the group was before the experiment. So it was just not to focus. So the learnings are here extremely limited. I mean, basically, nothing to learn for UBR or basic income. Canadian Mincome experiment. It comes from the 70s. The Canadian government selected one town, a whole town of 10,000 people, inhabitants, and decided that all the poorer households will get a top up from the government so that they also reach a certain level. I think it's like 14,000. Australian dollars, and if you earn less than that, you get money from the government. You earn 10,000, they pay you four, you become again 14. That was the experiment, and they wanted to check, you know, if it's affordable, uh, what, how is employment, how is poverty reduction. One of the biggest experiments actually at that time. Three years later, they look at the results. In a few segments, employment had decreased. That was their biggest fear, but actually it was only in the single mom segment and some uh, teenagers, which is rather understandably, but uh, that was still a bit critical in the country. But even more importantly, Canada went to a financial crisis at, that, at the end of, more or less at the end of that um, experiment, and unemployment increased quite significantly. Meaning that then the government was really concerned that such a program would anyway be not feasible financially because so many people would need to get money from the government. 
so it was all shelved and we didn't really hear from it like three decades until 10 years ago a researcher a canadian researcher discovered some boxes with the results of this particular experiment and then she published a research paper with positive results which were not published at the original time like three decades ago and the headline was that especially the hospitalizations of the people who get this benefit have been lower and declining compared to the control group who, was not, who were not getting it. So this was the main thing. And also boys especially were staying a bit longer at school. So it's a bit like the, op the other side of the boys were less likely to be employed, but because they were staying longer at school, which is definitely a positive impact. However, you know, from the experience from Finland, this time I said, okay, let me look at this research myself. So I found the original research, I read it, and also I read some follow-up research. It comes out that this claim that through this extra income, the hospitalizations were declining lower. It's quite a weak one. Because when you look at the graphic, you see that the hospitalization decline did not only happen in this group that was getting the benefit, but also in the control group, which was not getting it. And also there were other elements, already there were two differences between two, two groups, and there was also a new hospital in that region. So all these effects have quite a lot of impact on hospitalization, and it's rather difficult or almost impossible to say that this extra income resulted in declining hospitalizations. So unfortunately, again here, the learnings are rather limited especially for a grand scheme like universal basic income. Let's continue with a bit more positive one. It's the Kenya Give Directly. Give Directly is an organization, a kind of a charity, that says that instead of making huge bureaucratic charities trying to do a lot ourselves, let's give the money directly to people who need it. They will know best. So if we get $100 in donation, we try to give $97 or even more directly to the people. They're, that's why it's called Give Directly. And uh, they do tests in Africa, like in Kenya. In Kenya, they made a test that they give a lump sum, quite a big amount, one time, to poor uh, villages, households, and then check what happened. Really quite properly done research. And when you look at that, uh, the first results came from this experiment. It shows that, uh, the, of course, the well-being um, and then the household um, wealth is, has increased. But not also the households who get the benefit. Also, other there's a spillover effects. The local economy also improved. So quite a lot of positive effects. And there were no impact on health or education. That also shows up, not that negative part, but it's also a short one, uh, short uh, term benefit, quite understandably. And now this organization is continuing their experiment. Now they have a monthly benefit and which will, they will look even up to 13 years. What I like here a lot is that they make a very sound research. They publish their results openly and they have a lot of different research streams going on. I mean, this, it's not very clear yet to which direction it will go. And the learnings will be a bit limited for richer countries, obviously. But still, I think this is the way it should be done. Next is Cherokee Indians Casino Dividend. This sounds a bit interesting, but it is actually a similar go the direction of a basic income. This uh, um, Native American tribe uh, have the license to operate casinos in their land. And they decided to share the profit of the casino with all their tribe members. So every year, I think they give it monthly or year, they get like four to six thousand dollars. Everyone, all tribe members. And uh, this has been going on for quite long, so we have good results. And the results are quite positive. We see that um, their education and health actually it has improved. And they did not stop working. That's always a fear, right? When you get a basic income, people stop working. But in this case, employment levels stay the same. So, quite positive. 
it becomes just a bit less positive when you compare um, their current standing with the state average. Because in the state average in which this tribe is located, um, the tribe still gets um, is less well educated, less likely to work, and they also earn less. And this, although, despite the fact that they have been getting this extra benefit on top for a very long time, so they were not able to catch up. But this is a bit the negative part for this particular experiment. Iran oil subsidy reform. Now we are going to another level, a whole country, a national level, getting closer to a really universal kind of experiment. Iran is an oil producing country, and one of the biggest ones actually. And like in more, most oil producing countries, the population expects oil to be, let's say, dirt cheap. And it came to this level that uh, Iranians were paying 20 times less than the market price abroad. There were a bit of problems with that. A, the government was really losing money because they could have, you know, sell this oil in the world market and get significant uh, money for that. And secondly, there was huge pollution because the Iranians were using oil as if it's water. So, because to stop this, they decided that uh, we will decrease the subsidies, so oil become much more expensive. But uh, Iranians have seen what happened in other countries who tried to uh, do the same. People uh, riot and civil unrest, it becomes quite ugly. So the Iranians said that let's do it like this. We will announce that everyone will get cash in their hand and then we will, um, we will actually increase the uh, prices. So that they said that, hey guys, oil price will increase, but you'll get money. So don't worry, it will cancel each other out. Especially it was for the poor people because uh, the poor people are less likely to use a lot of oil, they are less likely to have cars, and the money is the same for everyone, so they will actually even profit. It sounds, frankly, on paper, quite brilliant. And they did really good. With right PR, slowly, they made um, you know, public figures explaining it, being in favor, I mean, newspaper, I mean, very coordinated textbook effort, I would say. And uh, actually the initial results were also quite good. Um, you see that uh, poverty decreased, inequality decreased, and employment did not seem to be uh, have an incredible drop. But it did not take very long and the uh, results started changing. First, we saw that um, one problem was that the savings from um, getting rid of the subsidy was not big enough definitely not big enough to cover the expenses of this program, because this program became huge. They thought that they, want, they could give it maybe only to poor or get away with a bit going to the middle classes, but they could not even identify who really belonged to which classes. So in the end, 90% of the Iranian population ended up getting this subsidy benefit. So 90% getting a benefit, but savings not enough to cover it. I mean, it became unfinanceable. Iran was also double unlucky. At the same time, um, USA was also having some sanctions, so they couldn't sell even enough oil, so they were squeezed from there as well. And financially it became completely unfeasible. Uh, what happened is that there was also a huge inflation, and they could not increase this uh, benefit uh, along and correlated with the inflation. They let it just drop until this benefit became insignificant. I think today even though it still exists, but it's not substantial like basic income levels anymore. Mongolia resource to cash payment. This is now a real universal benefit. We are talking about something that 100% of the population gets it. It all started as an election promise. We will, pro we will share our mining profits. You see, Mongolia is has a lot of mines, and they make money from mining. Not oil, but other uh, natural resources. And the government promised to give a substantial amount to everyone because they wanted to share the profit. They want to, basically, they won the election. They had to promise that. This also, substantial amount, inequality and poverty decreased immediately. It had a very positive effect. But in a similar story like Iran, Mining's profit were not high enough to cover it. I mean, they expected more, 
mining profit did not come. Soon after, they could hardly pay it. The debt, public debt of the country increased dramatically. Inflation jumped. They couldn't pay. There were riots on the streets, and they had to stop it. So far, quite logical. Interesting in this whole Mongolia story is that the public decided that this was anyway a bad idea. The people were saying that, why doesn't our government invest in schools and creating jobs instead of just distributing money? That is what the Mongolian people said. And then the Mongolian parties came together and they banned the use of such, such, such promises as in elections by political parties. So they really make a law out of that. That's what I find quite interesting. I want to go back to that quote from the Mongolian public. They were asking, why does the government just give us money instead of building schools and creating new jobs? I think this question is valid also for us, for Western countries, richer countries, because universal basic income, the way actually it's defined, will remain to be always a very expensive scheme. Admittedly, we can afford it, but it will certainly take resources away from other stuff. And if we are faced between the choice between just giving people money or investing more in education, skill development, lifelong learning, innovation, ability, capacity to build new jobs. Do we really want to go for the former? Is it really the right time in all these changes to actually invest less in the future, less in capacity and capability building, less in innovation? These are the questions that we need to answer before we really want to commit to a scheme like universal basic income.